So it's about uh, um, some issues of these two new um, controllers. And um, the presentation is made of two parts. In the first one, I will uh, just report on the last facts. And uh, in particular, I will talk, you, uh, talk with, you about, with you about uh, um, a comparison that I made between these new controllers and, uh, uh, sorry, I will first describe a little bit these controllers and then show you my results for a comparison that I made between uh, uh, these controllers and the uh, BFQ IO scheduler. The essential result that uh, I've obtained is that uh, uh, these controllers uh, with several common workloads uh, just fail uh, to do uh, their job. So they, they fail to control bandwidth, which is their goal, or to control latency, and they also fail to, to reach a high throughput. And uh, so this uh, raised the natural question, uh, why? And the goal of this presentation is to um, show you what I found out while trying to understand why they failed. I carried on, um, let's say, an in-depth analysis of these uh, controllers and maybe uh, what I found may teach something even a little bit more general than just um, understanding what goes wrong in these controllers. So uh, the use case of interest for these controllers is when you have multiple entities that compete for some shared storage. So entities may be anything, processes, groups, containers, virtual machine, whatever you want. The goal is to guarantee to each of these entities at least a bounded uh, latency um, or uh, also a, a minimum bandwidth, minimum IO bandwidth. Uh, there are several mainstream solutions to reach this goal, but uh, all of them waste up to 90% of the speed of a drive, which is really a lot and it's a little bit paradoxical given the current trend towards higher and higher speed. Um, there is, I, I, I wrote a sort of survey on, on this, you can see the address on the slide. Uh, the BFQ, the, the BFQ IO scheduler actually um, can control IO and at the same time reduce this waste of speed to almost nothing. So you, you can fully utilize your drive, uh, but BFQ is not a common solution for these use cases, for this use case, at least not yet. So uh, to improve the situation, uh, these two new IO controllers have been um, proposed. Uh, and they are the, uh, they live in uh, C groups and they are the IO latency and the IO cost controllers. Uh, the, in IO latency, uh, every group is associated with a target latency and the controller just throttles groups uh, so as to um, let each group meet its target latency. Uh, IO cost is more complex. And in this case, every, each group is associated with a weight and the controller throttles group um, so as to give to, a, to each group a fraction of the bandwidth of the drive proportional to the weight of the group and inversely proportional to the cost of the I.O. done by the group. So uh, the idea is that um, the more the group does some I.O. That, that costs a lot, that takes a lot of time to be completed, mm, random I.O. for example, uh, the less uh, percentage of the drive time is given to that group, so that the group does not uh, lower the throughput too much, sort of punished for doing costly I.O. So this is the, uh, the policy, and with this uh, scheme you can also uh, provide latency guarantees because you can just uh, um, assign to a group a bandwidth compatible with the latency that you want to get. 
uh, interestingly, uh, th these are the same goals uh, of uh, BFQ, because in BFQ, uh, every group, or actually also each process, but this is not essential, each group is associated with a weight, and IO is scheduled, in this case it is scheduled, not throttled, it is scheduled so as to let each group uh, get a fraction of the bandwidth proportional to the weight of the group. So it's exactly the same goal as uh, IO cost. Um, in particular, in uh, BFQ, um, slow IO uh, receives guarantees in the time domain instead of the bandwidth domain. Again, for the same goal as for IO cost, that is to avoid that slow IO uh, lowers the utilization of, uh, of a drive. And as with IO cost, one can have latency guarantees indirectly by setting weights uh, in, um, appropriately. So uh, the goals of these new controllers are uh, essentially the same as those of uh, BFQ, and one may wonder when to use these new controllers, uh, when to use the old uh, BFQ. But no documentation is available on this. So this motivated me to uh, compare uh, these controllers with BFQ and try to, to find out. So I made this uh, performance comparison. You can see the results, for example, in that uh, presentation that I gave last year. Um, in, in particular, this comparison is about the ability uh, to guarantee bandwidth and latency and at the, set, at the same time to reach a high uh, total throughput. <laughs> In essence, the result is that uh, BFQ actually outperformed these controllers. For example, on, on an SSD, um, the, um, the group under test received up to 47 times more throughput than with IO cost, and the total throughput was up to three times higher uh, with, uh, with BFQ. Um, why? Um, not because BFQ had any paranormal performance, it's just because those controllers failed. They failed to control bandwidth with some workloads, or they failed to reach a high throughput. But this, these results this didn't answer the next questions. Why? Why did they fail? So the goal of this presentation is showing and telling you what, what I found out about the why. Um, I'll try to restrict this presentation to as few details as possible, and in any case, details will be many, I'm sorry. So first, I will restrict only to IO cost, because IO cost is a sort of superset of IO latency, so what I will tell you about IO cost applies to IO latency as well. Uh, then I will consider only three of the workloads for which IO cost fails, and these are workloads workload executed on that SSD with XT4, but uh, the same out I had the same outcome with all the drives that I test, and there were more than five or six, well, probably more different drives. I tried both with XT4, better FS, same outcome. The reason is that the problem is so general that it affects any file system, any, any drive. Uh, okay, um, so I'm about to show you one of my plots and uh, uh, you can find the, uh, written down the things that I'm about to tell you in that presentation in, in case you need to. So uh, what do we have in this plot? This plot shows results for one of my benchmarks. In this benchmark, I um, let uh, several processes do I.O. in parallel. If I remember well, they were 16 in this case. Um, every uh, process was encapsulated in a group. Um, a group one of the groups is the, was the target group, the group that I used as a probe to measure bandwidth, latency, whatever it was. The other groups were the interferers. Their goal was just to create IO that interfered with my target group to see, to see what happened. So the target group gives an idea of what may happen to any uh, group. Um, what else? Um, 
In this case, the interferers did only random sync reads or random asynchronous uh, writes. And the two uh, policies compared were, of course, the one of IO cost. Uh, when the policy was that of IO cost, there was no scheduling because I wanted IO cost to have full control. Uh, the comparison was with BFQ, and the, the policy implemented by BFQ is the proportional share policy. Uh, the bars show throughputs. The uh, pink bar is the throughput of the target, the throughput enjoyed by the target. The cyan bar is the uh, total cumulative throughput of, the, of all the interferers. So the sum of the bars is the total throughput that you get. Finally, there is a dashed line that is the throughput that you get if you let the process processes run in the wild, so with no control, which is the case where usually you get the maximum total throughput because you leave the drive free to reorder requests in the best possible way for throughput. Uh, what else? I think I told you almost all. Um, so the, I want to focus only on the third subplot. In this case, the target is a sequential reader and the interferers are random readers. And as you can see uh, from the bars, um, the um, target is eating all the bandwidth and the interferers get almost nothing. Uh, the throughput, the total throughput is very high because if you let only a sequential reader go instead of uh, a few random readers, of course you get a much higher throughput. That throughput is also close to the one you get without control, which, which is another signal that the controller is not controlling. They're simply getting, processes are getting <laughs> what they would get also in case there is no control. So control is failing for some reason. And I want to show you why, what I found out about the why. So this is one of the cases of failure, failure to provide the expected bandwidth distribution. The other case is failure to reach a high throughput. Um, the two last subplots are the ones I want to focus on. And uh, uh, in this case, the uh, target is a sequential reader. So in both cases, the target is a sequential reader. And the interferers are sequential readers or sequential writers. So a test with reads and a test with writes. And in both cases, as you can see, the total throughput is much lower than what you get with a, a BFQ. Also in this case, this is a failure because what is happening here? It is happening that for some reason, uh, IO cost is throttling groups too much at no avail. It's just slowing down everything for basically no, no benefit. Um, so to analyze uh, the cause of this problem, I, I made a small patch to trace the internals of IO cost and uh, so I've, I've um, obtained some traces, and these traces point to the following cause. Drives have very complex transfer function. By transfer, transfer function, I mean the function that tells you the output given the input. So the input is uh, what, what are your requests you uh, dispatch, and at what time the output is what are your requests are completed and at what times. Uh, these transfer functions are complex because drives are complex for reasons that you know better than me. So multiple channels, um, in pipelines, striping, parallelism that depends on locality or interference that depends on locality, read ahead, uh, reordering, garbage collection, wearing, and so on and so on. So they are complex and they are parameters. So the parameters of this function that tells you what will happen in output, these parameters are nonlinear. They vary with time. They vary with workloads. Given the same workloads, they still vary with time during the execution of the workload. And in, they are hard to uh, guess, hard to know, hard to compute. All of this affects IO cost because IO cost uses those, some of these parameters to control IO. IO cost uses these parameters. In particular, it uses IO costs and device uh, saturation. So these are the two or three slides about uh, with, with a lot of uh, details. 
Um, so the um, IO cost measures the service received by each group as a function of these IO costs that are um, um, and estimates of how, how long it takes to execute that IO. This cost is uh, estimated through a model, a uh, linear model, so every IO has a base cost and a, a cost coefficient. The base cost tells you how long it will take at least, then there is a coefficient that tells you the slope with which the uh, time um, grows with the size of the IO. So this is the model. And uh, these uh, base cost and coefficient depend only on the type of the IO. The problem is that this is not true because actual IO costs vary with time and IO patterns. They are not only a function of the type of that single IO in isolation. This is completely false. Uh, even uh, what uh, IO cost does modifies the cost of the IO because by throttling IO, IO cost modifies the IO pattern. So it, it, it's very complicated. So there is a deviation between the modeled and the actual IO costs, and this causes a misestimate of the service received by uh, groups. So when IO cost tries to give to every group the right amount of service, it doesn't give the right amount of service because the service is estimated wrongly. IO cost is somehow aware, aware of this issue and try to counter it, to address this issue, but all in terms of uh, its consequences on total throughput. And so what IOCOS does is modifying dynamically weights, uh, but also this feedback loop fails. And I'll show this in extra slides for some of those of you who want to see them, but because I don't want to add uh, even more details. So I want to go straight to the last bit of information before showing you the problem. It's a big bit. <laughs> um, so IO cost uh, dispatches IO at a rate proportional to a parameter named V rate. This parameter is adjust dynamically with the goal of keeping the drive constantly busy, always busy, but not overloaded. And uh, in turn, this V rate is computed as a function of the busy level of the drive, and the busy level is evaluated as a function of two pieces of information. One is the number of groups that are receiving too much service and the number of groups that are receiving too little service, so group in surplus and group lagging behind. And the other piece of information is the current latency suffered by your requests. This latency is compared with uh, some uh, static thresholds that the user may modify. So this evaluation of the busy level is imprecise because these surpluses and legs are affected by the imprecision in the evaluation of the IO cost. And also because the relation between the latency experienced by IO request and the actual device saturation depends on the IO patterns but nothing of this is taken into account in the algorithm of IO cost. So I can finally show you uh, the consequences of all of this. Mm, the, consequences is that, the consequence is that, depending on the actual transfer function, it may be hard for IO cost to control bandwidth and boost throughput stably and effectively. But maybe I've already told you a lot of details, so <laughs> one may get lost and you may have a hard time grasping the essence of the problem. So I'll try to show it to you with a real life example that maybe it's easier to grasp. Uh, suppose you are in a building where nobody puts any particular care in uh, making a water heating system that is stable and easy to control. And you have to take a shower so somewhere in this, in this building. Uh, probably you will have a hard time getting the temperature right. Because when you rotate the, the knob, you stimulate in a nonlinear way a nonlinear system that reacts uh, with time varying delays. And especially at the beginning, uh, when you this should okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't know the system at all, probably you, you risk to get burned or to, to have you, the water too cold. But 
even after you got control of your system, so you are happy with the temperature, something may happen externally. Yeah, this, this was very <laughs> nice. And so it, it, the parameters of the system may change externally, so you could get burned even if you haven't touched anything. So uh, I hope I gave you the intuition. This is exactly what happens to IO cost because it has to control a nonlinear system without knowing all the parameters of the system or by knowing them in an imprecise uh, way. Now I'm about to show you this with a plot more seriously, only for uh, throughput. Um, there are extra slides in case you want to know why it fails also with bandwidth. So um, in this plot, uh, in blue, uh, there, uh, there are traced the uh, busy level. There is the busy level traced. In green, the number of uh, uh, groups that are lagging behind their target service. And in red, the V-rate. Basically, the V-rate tells you the current throughput. So uh, in, in this test, this, this, this was the bad results with only reads. So the sequential reader against the uh, sequential readers. The only reads. At the beginning, the throughput is high, the V-rate is high, so things start well at the beginning. But then, for some reason, there is a spike in the busy level. And busy level evaluated imprecisely for all the reasons that I already told you. So for this reason, uh, IO cost suddenly reduces V-rate. And then it remains stable because the uh, estimate parameters are somehow stable, uh, then IOCOS seems to realize that the rate must be increased, but while increasing it, it gets again a new spike in the busy level, so again, a sudden drop of the rate, and then it gets worse and worse and worse, because even if the drive is definitely not saturated, because the throughput is extremely low with respect to the maximum that it could get, still, uh, IOCOS believes that the drive I is too busy. Um, and uh, it has a hard time recovering from this situation also because um, groups start to lag behind their target service. And in the logic of IOCOS, if some groups are lagging, th that one is a signal that the device is too saturated. So it's completely wrong, and the rate remains low. It starts to recover a little bit at the end, but after 35 seconds, this test was over. So most of the time, the throughput was very low, as I showed you in the plots with the, with the throughputs. This is, this is what happens in the test for the writes, in case interferers do writes. Also, in this case, the uh, V-rate is very high at the beginning, so the throughput is high. But then again, this strange spike and uh, V-rate goes down, remains down, uh, and then starts to recover a little bit, but very, very slowly. When it has recovered half of the speed, the, the test is finished because a lot of time has already passed. You can also see that it is, it is very slow. In addition to the other problems, it recovers very slowly, but it goes down uh, very sharply. So yeah, it's, it's tilted in the wrong way. Um, so to wrap up, um, for sure, these uh, controllers have been craft and crafted and tuned carefully and skillfully for the machines of the odors of these controllers. So they work with those machines. The problem is that if you change the transfer function, then, uh, as I showed you, it may become hard or even impossible uh, to control I.O. because your model uh, is, um, does not match the real hardware. And, OK, <laughs> this is all. So if you have any question? Questions? Luckily, we all took showers before we started the session this morning. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so at the beginning of the talk, you, you said you were going to explain why BFQ was able to do a better job. 
Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yes. Uh, actually, I forgot to add that slide. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's in the document from which I took these, uh, these slides, but I forgot to add it. The reason why BFQ succeed is very simple. Uh, let me leave just the slide on BFQ, but it doesn't add anything and no, no, no information. Anyway, BFQ is this one. It succeeds just because it doesn't use those parameters. That's why it succeeds. BFQ just, um, given the total number of sectors transferred uh, during uh, a given time interval, uh, distributes this number of sectors uh, to each group in proportion uh, to the weight of the group. That's it. And this always works, whatever the parameters are. Yes. 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 So if you are not happy with that distribution, you user statically and slowly change the weights. So it's like in the, with the example of the shower, it's just you that say, okay, I don't like this temperature. Uh, let me try to move the knob, but I will wait a lot of time, then I will <laughs> be back in the shower. It's different from just, <laughs> oh, it's too cold, it's too warm, no, it's too cold, and, and go on doing this way, which is what IOCOS does all the time. Okay. Um, or maybe use the pool instead of a shower. <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. A whole different strategy. All right, any final question for, for Paolo? Thank you for, okay. for keeping us awake. Thank you. So we'll get a 25-minute break. Um